All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Dreamforce. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I hope everybody's had a good start to their, their week so far. Um, I just want to say welcome uh, from us here at Salesforce. This is really our favorite week of the year. A lot of work goes into this, but we really relish the opportunity to be able to spend so much time with our customers and partners and really interact with you guys. Uh, hopefully, everybody's going to have a chance to you know, uh, spend some good time, lots of sessions, lots of great content over in the campground uh, and downstairs in the trailhead zone. So hopefully, everybody's ready to have a great week and learn a lot. So I can start by introducing myself. My name is Joshua Schneier. I'm the product manager for the mobile SDK. And this session is Fundamentals of Building Amazing Mobile Apps with the Salesforce and Mobile SDK. So we'll walk through some of the basics, uh, talk about some of the announcements that we've made recently, and, and take a look uh, ahead at what's coming. But before we get started, uh, for those of you who have been to Dreamforce before, you're probably familiar with the slide. For those who haven't, uh, you're going to see it a lot. This is our forward-looking statement. So basically, without reading through everything, just remember that uh, as a publicly traded company, we need to make sure that you make any purchase decisions based on functionality that's already currently available. So we always try to do our level best when we're presenting, being clear about what's available now and what's in the pipeline, but just want to make sure everyone's uh, aware of that before we get moving. So this uh, slide will be your friend by the end of the week. <laughs> OK, so next, uh, the agenda. So what we want to talk about, uh, introduction of the SDK. Uh, we'll get through a demo. We'll show you actually you can build, we're going to build an app right here and show you how that works and do some cool things with it. Uh, talk a little bit about what's next, and we'll save some time for questions. All right, so for an introduction. Now, we're always talking to our customers and looking at the mobile landscape and trying to get a better feel about what really makes it successful uh, mobile app for the enterprise. You know, what qualities or traits does a mobile app need to have? And we kind of have narrowed this down to, to five key areas. Uh, the first is security, always first and foremost, right? So not every mobile use case is going to require you know, robust you know, authentication, identity services, et cetera. But in the enterprise, you know, it's usually pretty standard fare. And users don't want to be bothered by any of that. They just want to be able to log into the app and have the app work. So we need to make sure that we offer a good experience uh, to our users that is also fully secure. Uh, the next is secure storage. So you know, data security is always important, but in the enterprise, it can become even more so. We can typically find ourselves in regulated environments like financial services or healthcare, where we have a lot of extra requirements we need to worry about, the certifications that we need to comply with. So we want to make sure that that data is, is safe and secure and in following industry standard best practices. Uh, next is offline. So you know, for I've been in mobile for a while, and you know, we always think we're just on the edge of having connectivity everywhere, and we won't need to worry so much about offline. But I think at this point, you know, we know that's probably never going to be the case, right? We know, uh, for in some cases, we may never have connectivity. We could be in a rural area, or maybe working on an oil field. We've had some use cases like that, or an industrial environment. Maybe you're in the in the basement of a facility here, like uh, the Moscone Center, and there's zero signal. Uh, or you could be in a hospital where you know, there's absolutely you know, no connectivity or no Wi-Fi allowed. So we want to make sure that we have a, a great user experience uh, regardless of whether or not the device is connected or not. And the app should feel the same and behave the same. And as a developer, you know, we don't want you to have to worry about you know, coding you know, for two different scenarios. The app should just work you know, the way you want that UI to work. Uh, next is messaging. So you know, it's always important to have a great user experience design. You know, we apps want apps to be friendly and easy to use, easy to navigate. It should be easy for users to find their data. But you know, one of the great things about mobile devices is we can bring that power of the notification to, you know, to bear. Uh, when we can surface that information proactively when and where it's relevant, then things get really powerful. So if we can save the user from having to dig around through the app, although you know, we want to make sure that's easy to do when they need to, but if we can bring that information up, it gets even better. Uh, the next is scalability. So it should really be easy, as easy to build an app for 100,000 users as it is to build an app for 100 users. So you know, thankfully now we're kind of in the modern age of, of cloud platforms where you don't need to worry about that as much, you know, as long as you kind of uh, you know, make your plans right. But we want to make sure that developers are able to build an app and not have to worry about scaling their back end or dealing with upgrades. So with these five traits as a backdrop, let's take a look at what we try to offer uh, inside the, the mobile SDK. So the first two at the top are kind of two for one. Um, this is how we try to address uh, both the offline um, 
you know, requirements and also the data security uh, at rest. So we have two frameworks, the Smart Sync Data Framework and the Smart Store Encrypted Database. The Smart Sync Data Framework allows you to keep data that you define, so you can pick and choose you know, which objects and what criteria you care about to identify records within those objects, and we'll keep that up to date in the background. You don't have to worry about you know, coding a synchronization process or making sure that that data is, is diffed and kept up to date. We'll take care of that for you as long as you just tell us which data you care about. And we keep that up to date inside our smart store encrypted database. So this fully secures the data at rest, but also the nice thing about this is that it's also fully connected with our Salesforce identity framework. So when we're talking about you know, sharing rules or permissions, if a user suddenly loses access to an object, you don't have to figure out how we're going to go adapt you know, our local data model. We'll take care of all that for you, keep it up to date with the, um, as it's hooked in with the identity. So the, hopefully this makes it really easy for you to build apps kind of the way you're used to doing it. Um, it just kind of feels like you, I mean, once you kind of set up the smart sync, it just feels like you're working against a local data store and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the next is security. So we offer a lot of identity and security support here. And we go through the demo, you'll see how you just get this out of the box. Uh, we have support for uh, not only for OAuth, but for single sign-on, uh, certificate-based authentication. We support a lot of different schemes here. And we also have some support for mobile device management. Uh, we know uh, a lot of customers or a lot of enterprises need to actually you know, take control of their users' devices via MDM, and they may need to apply certain policies. Uh, it could be something as simple as providing a unique login URL. So users, when they to log into the app, they don't have to type in you know, a big, long string just to be able to point to you know, your authentication server. Or it could be you know, something more security focused like disabling copy and paste inside the application. Maybe you want to lock that down so nothing moves out. So we support some of those keys that come down from uh, the MDM servers. Uh, so really out of the box, you can get that capability uh, in your custom app that it plays nice with MDM, which is pretty cool. Uh, the next is around messaging, our push notification service. So we in the SDK provide, uh, again, out of the box, uh, the capability so when that app comes to life on the device, it's going to register with the push notification service providers, either with, with Apple or Google, get those push registration tokens and automatically provide it back to the user Salesforce org. So now in the org, when a notification worthy event happens, you have what you need to be able to send a notification right to that device. And in Salesforce, we also handle that. You don't have to go out and find a separate provider just to talk to those notification services. So you can send the notification when the event occurs in the org uh, right to the device. And finally, uh, for scalability, this is all built on the Salesforce platform, with hopefully, which hopefully everyone is pretty familiar with at this point. Again, we don't want developers to have to worry about what happens if I get another 100 users, what happens if I get another 1,000 users. Everything is, is fully scalable, and we're talking about you know, upgrades. Uh, we're talking about uh, you know, increased throughput. This is really, everything's built on the Salesforce platform. It just scales the way you need it to without you having to worry about it. So hopefully, you can have a little bit of understanding about you know, what we tried to think about when we, we built the SDK, you know, what do we need to offer developers, and how we're actually doing that. So the pieces that we have in the SDK that allow you to build these apps. And we try to take a lot of the stuff you know, just off the table at the beginning. You don't have to worry about you know, all this housekeeping. Uh, we take care of that for you, and you can just focus right in on, on building your app. You know, one thing that we didn't mention here, which is also pretty important, is you know, the user experience. And we touched on that a little bit. But that's something that we really leave up to you, the developer. Because if you're building a custom application in the first place, odds are you're probably going to have a pretty specific requirement for what your user experience needs to be. You're going to have pretty tight click paths that you're going to want to follow. So that's not really something that we try to define. So we take everything else for you and just let you focus on building that user experience and delivering a great app to your users. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Wolfgang, who is one of the developers in our team, actually one of our architects. And he's going to show you actually how we build uh, an app in the SDK real time here. And um, take it away. All right, hi, everyone. I'm going to show you actually how it gets used. Uh, so what we have, what we wanted is to make it really easy for people to get started with mobile SDK, right? So all you have to do is install an NPM package called Force iOS, if you want to build an iOS app. Oops. Oops, sorry. Is it better? All right, so I think I can hear myself now. So um, let me show you how to actually get started mobile SDK. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to build an app 
make some changes to this app. And I want to show you how easy that is. So we have an NPM package called Force iOS to help you build uh, awesome Swift application. By the way, we also support other platforms like Android, Hybrid App, and uh, React Native as well. So Force iOS is an NPM package, so you simply need to do an NPM install Force iOS to get started. So we've done that before the, and then Force iOS has a number of little actions. The one I'm gonna use today is to create an app. You also have, you can also create an app from templates. We support a number of templates out of the box. It will let you discover those templates through Force iOS and create apps from there as well. So when you create uh, with Force iOS, you can either pass all the arguments at once, that's probably the thing you would do if you did that from a script, or you can do it interactively. So I want to be able to Swift application. Let me give it a name, uh, well, today's Dreamforce, so let's call it Dreamforce demo, uh, panel ID, and the org I'm in, and then you say just do it right here in the current directory. So what's happening right now is that it's gonna generate a Xcode workspace and it's pulling all the dependencies it needs. So the mobile SDK, but also third-party dependencies that we use. So this is pretty fast, uh, but I'm not sure how fast the network here is. So instead of letting it run, I'm gonna show you the end result. So what you end up with is an, X, uh, an Xcode workspace. And the great thing is this application can actually be run. So with the application we generate is ready to go. So I think the first thing I wanna do is just show you what you get out of the box, and then we'll dive into the code to see uh, some of the important bits. All right, so let me run this application from Xcode. It's gonna build and run and bring up the simulator. Oops, let me make this a little bit bigger. All right, I think that should be better. All right, so what you see here, sorry. <laughs> Try to grab the phone. All right, so the first thing you see is a login screen, so a typical uh, Salesforce login screen. Let me log into a dev org I created before this presentation. All right. I'm gonna get my typical you know, allow screen to say, do you want this connected app to get access to your data? So this is something you configure when you create a connected app for this mobile app. You've probably have seen that screen if you use Salesforce app. And then here all I have is a table view with a list of uh, usernames, which were pulled from the org. So a very simple app, but it works. And it's actually already logging into Salesforce and putting data down, which is pretty much what every app wants to do. So let's, let's dive into the code and see what's going on. So first class I wanna look at is the app delegate. So in the iOS world, the app delegate is the entry point to your app. So every app has a, a class called app delegate and it takes care of uh, app level events. For instance, what should we do when the app is foregrounded, backgrounded, what do you do when you get a push notification, and things like that. So the app we give you out of the box has all those things already configured. It also has some example code commented out. So if you want push notification, just uncomment this. If you want to do other uh, advanced or uh, flow, things like that, you also have some example code you can comment out. The block I want to, um, I want to emphasize is this one. So inside this uh, method called did finish launching with option, which is the entry point when the app gets you know, launched, basically, in every, is uh, three lines of code to actually start the OAuth flow. And then once that completes, show up, show your uh, main app, your main screen. So that's all you need to actually get OAuth into your app. In this case, we did this at app launch time, but of course you could do that later. There's some apps that don't need to be authenticated when you first launch them. Maybe they show some you know, public data and then only need to take, talk to Salesforce later. So you don't have to have that block of code there, right? It would work from anywhere. And so the first time it's actually gonna show you the OAuth screen. After that, what we do is we keep the refresh token in the keychain and we don't need to go through that flow again. That's the benefit of using a, an application, by the way. Okay, so those are the only lines they need. So even though it's extremely simple from the developer point of view, there's a lot of the, uh, stuff going on under the cover, right? You could support different auth flow, you could have SSO, other flow set up, you could do third base authentication. There's all kind of scenarios we support of the box. For the developer building the app though, it's always gonna be just those two lines of code. The rest is just configuration for the admin. All right, so that's, I think, enough for the app delegates. Now let's go look at that thing on that screen for this app. So this screen is, we, we, we kept it simple so that the, uh, you, know, you wouldn't get lost into um, app logic if you want. So what we have here is a basic uh, table view. So if you've done uh, iOS development before, you've probably have seen that before. So when you want to have a screen that shows a table, you use a, what they call a table view controller. So some of the code in here before I look at that is boilerplate code you get in every table view. You know what to render in every cell and typically it's backed by some uh, 
a data variable like this one, for instance. So here I have data rows, which is going to contain the data to show every row. And uh, the only interesting part really in that class is how do I populate those data rows with data coming from the server? So what we do is, upon loading the view, we want to send a request to the server and then parse the data back and put that in data rows, right? And so this is done with basically two, uh, a few lines of code, eight lines of code or so. So the first one is the building the request. So I know I want to run a SQL query. I, I don't need to know, you know what, what's the endpoint for doing a SQL query, how am I supposed to encode the parameters running that. I just pass in the SQL query, so I get a request object. And then I can say, okay, through my REST client, send that request object. Again, you don't have to worry about the auth header you're supposed to put in, what happens if it's, you know, a session is expired, I need to replay the request, do a refresh and replace. You don't do, do any of that stuff. All you do is build my request, I know I saw call query. So in this case, select name from user. I'm just getting the first 10. And I'm sending the requests. So there is what you do on failure. When, uh, you know, if something happens, you're not connected. And then the second block is the actual passing the response back, putting them in the data row. Uh, instance variable, and then asking the table to reload itself. So that's it. So really, you can really focus on your app logic, right? I'm not dealing with either, uh, you know, with low-level details. Don't have to worry about those. Okay. So this was just uh, the basic app you get out of the box. And, uh, but I think it's a good way to get started because you see kind of the important pieces in action. And um, so now I wanted to actually start making some changes to this app. So what we would like to do is make this app what we call offline first. By offline first, we mean uh, if you want your app to work uh, the same way online and offline, you probably should architect it to, you know, work the same way basically in both cases. How do you do that? So the way you would do that is have your app talk to your local database and then have separately that local database be synchronized with the remote database. So the app logic, your app code, always expect the data to be there somehow. So you don't have a bunch of you know, conditional code that says, okay, wait, if I'm online, do this. If I'm offline, do that. That makes the code really complex. It's all over the place. Also, the, the, it might behave differently. It's not going to be very graceful when you go offline in the middle of an operation, things like that. As opposed to if you just talk to local database and basically build the app like you've built app for many years. You know, for many years, we have apps. They have a database behind, and you just get data from the database. In this case, still the same thing, except the database happens to talk to a remote database. So you let, uh, you let the mobile SDK take care of the synchronization between local and remote database using SmartSync, and you just have your app talk to your local database, which in this case would be Smart Store. So how do we do that? Can I do that in 10 minutes <laughs> in the demo? So the first thing is, well, I need to put a database in my app, and I need to define the schema, right, the table for holding the data. So what we've, uh, what we have, so you can do that. We have APIs for doing that. We also let you do that through config files. So I'll show you how you do that. So I have a file here, a little JSON file. I'm going to drop into my true Xcode, and I'm going to show you the content of it. Um, so the the database we use here is called Smart Store, like Josh mentioned before. So it gives you two key features. One is encryption, because that data is enterprise data needs to be encrypted. So we, we we, 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 we use strong encryption for that data. And the second uh, key feature of the smart store is that you can deal with data. Uh, the shape of the data can change over time. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to have a frozen a fixed schema. And the reason is we did that is because that's exactly what you get on the server when you use us, us as, a, as a backend. Um, on the server, I can add custom objects, custom fields. I don't need to restart anything, right? That's the power of Salesforce. So we needed to have a database on the client that was just as flexible. You know, your clients, people install the apps. You might decide you make some changes on the server. You don't want the apps to stop working. You don't want to have to go back to the app store. So what you specify here when you create what we call a soup, which is really a table, is here are some of the key fields I need to really find you know, maybe for my query, for if I have a, a, a search screen or things like that, I still need to search by something. So if the name disappears from the record, then it won't work. But other fields, you don't care so much whether they're there or new ones come in. You can deal with dynamic data. All right, so this will define the schema for the uh, store. And then let me show you right away how you define the synchronization between this store and the backend store. Again, we got API for doing that. You can do it dynamically at runtime, but you can also do it through a config file. I can just drag and drop this here. And it looks, it's another JSON file. 
you define, you give a name to every synchronization. You can specify whether synchronization that comes, you know, data coming down from the server to the device or up. When it's data coming down, you can you have to specify what data you want to be pulling down from the server. You can use SoCo again. You could use SoCo MRU. We also have other uh, sync target type. You can uh, pull down data that involves you know parent and children records together, and you can also build your own custom targets that talks either to Force.com or to other backend services. So people have built apps where they synced data from Heroku or other third-party services. So the smart sync framework is not limited to Force.com, right? All right, so I have those two defined. I actually have to add a few lines of code. Right now I have the config files. I need to load them into the app. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to my app delegate here, and I'm going to copy paste some code so I don't make any mistake today. So there's a couple lines I need to add, which is basically a startup type and say, once I have a user and I've logged in, so right here in the block, I say, well, configure a star. So, this is only going to do work the first time. It's going to check, well, you already set up those tables and that sync, I need to, don't need to do anything. So you do that. Um, let me change another line of code here. This is at, you, when you first run the app, you need to initialize just for SDK. So it's kind of a, 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 it's a framework running inside your app and it needs to do some initialization once. If you're using smart sync, you need to use um, a subclass does the same work, and I think I have a couple of imports if I don't want the compiler to complain, so I'm gonna do, well, maybe I'll just do this one. All right, let me just try to build and see if that works. All right, I think it, it succeeded. All right, so what I have now is, um, so I have set up my table, and I have set up synchronization, but I'm not running them yet, and I'm also not uh, pulling my data from the store, right? I haven't changed that part of the app. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna go into the uh, root view controller again, and I'm gonna change this load view. and say, okay, I no longer wanna build a request that goes to the server. Instead, I'm gonna pull the data from local store. And I'm also gonna run those things. So let me, let me again, do some copy pasting, and then I'll show you. Um, so I'm just gonna replace the whole load view method here. And I'll explain what I'm doing after the fact. Okay, so up. All right, so let me show you what I did here. So okay, I need to get a, so I get a, an inst I get a, um, I get my store, so there's, all right, let me do an import, otherwise the compiler is gonna complain. All right, so here you go. So what we have here is, okay, I gave me my smart store, an object to, uh, to interact with my smart store, an object to interact with what we call the sync manager, which is the object that's responsible for running sync. And then the first thing I do is, uh, when I come in here, it's gonna say, okay, run that sync by name. So what's that resync method? We really have three APIs on the sync manager. One is called sync down, when you want to sync down data. One is called sync up, for syncing up data. And the last one is called resync, which is what you do to rerun a previously run sync. But actually, resync is, is, can also be used the first time. It's kind of smart. So it knows if you never run it, you meant a full sync. And uh, after that, it does, it tries to only get the data has changed. So I could do a full sync that brings down 10,000 records. And then the next day when I do a resync, I don't need to bring down all the data, I only need to date the delta. So it gets really efficient. So if you only update 100 records, only those will be pulled down subsequent time. Okay, so what I do here is when I first load the view, I wanna make sure to run a sync. Next, I need to, um, actually get that data into the data rows, right? Otherwise, right now it's gonna run a sync, the, pop the database is gonna be populated, but uh, you're not gonna see anything on screen because I didn't hook up uh, that part of the code. Okay, so let's do that next, and then we'll run the app and see. All right, so I'm gonna do this first, All right? And then a little helper method here, I'm gonna copy last, and then I'm gonna explain what I just did. And then we finally will run the code to make sure it runs. All right. All right. So what I do here is say, okay, when you first load that view, run a sync. It's an asynchronous operation, right? It can take a little while, depending whether it's the full sync or a fast one. And once the once the data is done, once the sync is done, um, call that load from store method. And the load from store method is kind of similar to what we did before. So instead of building a query, a request to do a circle on the server. 
uh, build a query to talk to local database. So first step is let's build that query object, you know. Here it's using the, um, it's kind of a modified SQL uh, that we call Smart SQL because remember where you could have uh, objects that are JSON with paths, things like that. So we can use quite exactly the SQL syntax. So you have the table name, soup name, and then the path inside it. So same thing as with what we did before, select the name from the user. And then, um, so I run, so this is the actual query. It's not run yet. This is where I run the query. And then the data rows is just, I'm pulling out the name from each one of them. And then, like I did before, I asked the table to reload itself. All right. So one last thing is you might ask, why are you calling this method twice? So I'm calling it when resync completes. I'm also calling it right away when I go through. So the idea here is that um, you want the app to show data as quickly as possible. So you, with the, this call here, will run right away. It's not waiting for any kind of round trip to the server. So you're going to get the, current, the currently available data right away. And then as soon as the resync completes, you'll get the freshest data. So the user will see kind of the screen updates with fresher data. Also, if you're not connected, that resync that goes to the server will not uh, be done, will not complete successfully, which is OK. So the user won't notice. So it's going to behave the same whether you're offline or online. All right. So I think I got everything. The compiler has not complained. So if I run this, I should, I could go, uh, uh, I don't want to go offline right now, but it would work the same way. So you notice I'm getting more users here. And the reason for that is my query here that didn't have a limit. I could put a limit too. We support the same syntax as SoCo. So the original SoCo query was doing a limit 10, and this one didn't have a limit. So I'm actually pulling all the objects from the server. So this org has a bunch of users like that. All right, so the last thing I want to show is uh, you know as you work like this on your application and you just got started, you say, okay, how, how do I go? What, what if something went wrong and I want maybe the data gone to the database, but I forgot to do uh, the query and I want to see did the sync run? Is, did this work? Well, what you can do, we have what we call uh, development tools, which are built into Mobile SDK, and they are automatically they enabled in a debug build and disabled in release builds, but you can also again programmatically enable them. So what you do is the shake uh, gesture, and there's a shortcut for it when you use the simulator, and it brings up a menu. So the number of actions you see in that menu depends on the app type you're using. You know, are you using Smart Store or not, and things like that. You can also it's extensible by developers. So developer if they really need to, they can extend that menu. First action I wanted to show you is the dev info. So this one kind of shows a lot of information about you know SDK version, the SQL Cipher version, and anything things like that, and that can be really useful, uh, especially if you have let's say you have enterprise built, you're testing your app internally, and people are like, you're not exactly sure what, it, what they installed and what they run, so you can check it there. You can check the OS settings here, so a lot of low level details, MDM settings. If you're using MDM, you know it can be difficult to debug and things like that. All right. Uh, the other action. Let me go back. There's some other actions that I think are very useful. So when you first build an app, you might not have yet a UI for doing logouts or switching users, which is something we support at Mobile SDK, right? You can be logged in as multiple users. We take care of partitioning the data. So maybe you don't have your UI, but you already want to make sure, is, are things working the way they should be? Uh, do, am I cleaning up everything I need to clean up when I log out? So even in this app where there's no UI yet for doing a logout, you can already try those flows. And one, the last section I want to show you is to Smart Store, Inspect Smart Store. So it's a simple uh, UI to quickly let you have a look at sweat. So you can write so uh, smart SQL query up there and run them. And these are uh, buttons for predefined queries. For instance, I can see, OK, I have two tables, user table and a sync soups table. Sync soups uh, is a system table we create when you use smart sync. And there's one row. So there's one sync that was defined. OK, so it did pick it up from the file. And the user table is the one where we populate. That's the one we created uh, in the schema. And you can see there's 100 rows there. So that was the limit I put in my synchronization definition. So even if I had forgotten to do the load form store, I could have go, uh, gone here and see, OK, I do see the sync running. I see that that came in. I could select name from here and see, get, um, see what the data is. So we find those very useful when you're developing because you don't want to be putting 50 console log statement or debugging. You, know, you can just get some info, uh, useful information right away. All right, so that's what I had uh, today. So just to recap uh, really quickly, what I did here is I first ran Force iOS to create the app. And this app was already um, allowed me already to um, you know, log in, get some data from the server. And then I made the app offline. I had, all I had to do was drop a couple of config files for the store and the synchronizations, a couple of lines of code. 
And then I just had to change my code to you know, do a select against the database instead of doing a select against the server. And that was all done in five, 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wolf. That was a, that was a great demo. Let's uh, catch up here to where we left off. I really like those, um, those developer tools we show at the end there. I think that's the kind of thing where as you're building an app, you've been working with it for a long time, and you've seen every flavor of problem, you figure, I need to add this one more little utility in there. I need to add this one more little extra bit of debug information. But one of the nice things about the SDK is we've been building this for a while, so all that's available out of the box for you guys. So we can take a minute and talk about what's next for the mobile SDK. So uh, some of you may have heard we made an announcement yesterday of uh, a new strategic partnership we have with Apple, which we're really excited about. So here we're going to be bringing together really the best devices that we think are out there and the number one CRM. So our plan here is really what we're going to be able to do is help users get their work done in new ways. Um, We've been working really closely with our friends uh, down at Cupertino. We've got a lot of collaboration uh, going on already, and we're seeing, starting to see some of the fruits of this. So you can actually take a look at the new Enhanced Salesforce mobile app that we're showing here at Dreamforce. Uh, you can take a look over at the, the campground area over in uh, Moscone South or downstairs here, um, here in Moscone West. We're running some demos of this. Uh, we've also optimized the, the mobile SDK. Uh, for iOS. So some of the code that we've gone through here, uh, we've optimized it for Swift. So we try to clean up the syntax a lot, make it really much more compact and user-friendly to build uh, native applications on Swift. And we're also working with Apple to develop new content on Trailhead. So hopefully everyone here is familiar with our Trailhead platform, which is really a self-learning platform. We can go and learn some new modules about Swift and Xcode. And coming soon, we're going to have a new uh, mobile Trailhead app. So you'll be able to take that, that learning on the go anywhere you want. Uh, and here's some more details on <laughs> the, uh, the new Trailhead uh, modules we have, again, for Swift and Xcode, uh, and then two of our existing modules, of course, the, uh, the Mobile SDK Basics and, and Native iOS. So if you run through these four modules, you'll be in really good shape to start building uh, native apps. So enhancements, what's next? What's coming down the pipe? So as I mentioned, we've done some optimization for, for Swift and, and native iOS. That's coming in our new 7.0 release of the Mobile SDK, uh, which we have scheduled for, for late this fall. Uh, we're also going to be bringing out Face ID support. It's another one of the things where we're trying to bring the latest functionality for iOS. And technically, we do already have this, but you know, one of the things we mentioned earlier was we try to keep the user experience pretty bare bones and leave that up to you. But for some of these housekeeping things like authentication or dealing with you know, Face or Touch ID, we're going to start to, start to try providing a little bit more for you out of the box. So we're going to have some nice screens and flows available for that biometric authentication. Uh, some more integration with uh, mobile application management. We talked a little bit before about our support for MDM, but you know, sometimes we hear from customers that you know, they don't want to take control of the user's device. Right? If I take control of that device, I've now just created a bunch of liabilities running around in people's pockets. I'd rather just like to control what the application can do without having to take over the whole device. So we're going to be offering some more capabilities there. Uh, also upgrading our, our templates and sample apps. You'll see a new suite of, uh, of templates and sample apps coming out. The one we went through today was, was pretty solid with that. You know, simple list of users, but we want to grow that so you have a little bit more to pick from uh, off the shelf. And enhanced notification support. So again, some of the newer features in, in iOS uh, are offering some really nice capabilities. You probably, some of us, most of us maybe have upgraded to iOS 12, and we've seen the grouped notifications. That's something that we get free out of the box, but there's more capability that's been announced, like you can now create a user interface directly within those notification extensions. Uh, we're going to be bringing out uh, custom actions and notifications. So a lot of new stuff is in the pipe. And background data sync is something that we're really hoping to tackle. Uh, it's been something we've been chewing on for a while. Uh, we know it's not the easiest thing to do uh, when your application goes in the background, but we'll hopefully we'll have something to, to talk about soon there. Uh, yeah, actually, just one moment. Um, I'm going to open this up for questions. Um, so if anybody's got any questions, please feel free to. We've got one of the mics here up front if you want to come up. And I think I just heard a question to go back a slide, so I'll, I'll come back to you now. You'll be the first question. Uh, was this the screen you're looking for? All right. OK. Here we go. Any questions? So um, yes, yeah, so there's, there's the mic here. If you guys want to come up, if not, you can just shout your question. I'll repeat it so we can catch it on the, on the recording. Yes. So Android is also an important platform for us. We continue to develop on it. Um, as we bring out the new features and functionality, we always try to keep them in parity wherever possible. Uh, but at the moment, uh, 
and some of the new features that we're talking about. We do have you know, the, the Face ID and the Touch ID support existing on Android. Some of those enhancements will be available as well. So I mean, I don't have a specific slide or specific content to talk about what's coming on Android, but wherever possible we do, we do try to keep them in parity. Yes? Yeah, so the question is about do we have support for pulling uh, custom objects as well as standard objects? Yeah, so and guys, keep me honest here, developers. In our eyes, all objects are equal. The standard object, custom object, it doesn't matter from the perspective of the SDK. An object is an object. So everything is just, it's kind of the, the nature of the platform. An object's an object. So, yeah. Sure. Uh, for custom applications? We have done some look at um, improving um, shared logins. So if you do have an, another Axe app you have to you log into, you can piggyback on top of a login for an existing app. Uh, in our off-the-shelf Salesforce mobile application, you know, there's a lot that you can do within the platform without having to build a custom app. But it's an interesting question about what I don't think that we've actually had a discussion about how we considered a container for custom native components and modules. No, so to answer the question, no, we haven't had a discussion about that, but that's a definitely an interesting question. Oh, yes. Yeah, does it work with external IDs and more relationships? Uh, you mean as far as, the, as, far as uh, running the SOCL? On the sync with the store, I would assume it's the ID, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think this, uh, so you're talking about referencing the data directly within the org that's coming into the org from another location, or you're trying to sync with a completely separate data source? With the Salesforce data. Yes, it works. So, um, so when you use uh, synchronization, so-called synchronization, you can also specify alternate ID field as well. So it's not tied just to the, you know, all of the blocked ID field. So there's a lot more flexibility than we showed here. So you can do that. Yes. Oh, sorry, yes. You mean the, so the, you're only going to see the data as the current user, right? As the user, yeah. So everything we do, we, we're limited by whatever the user can see. So we, you don't, so we're not using, we're using the uh, public API only. So we don't using so any uh, backdoor. So you're not going to see data you're not supposed to see or feel you're not supposed to do. Uh, to yeah, see. you don't want to re-implement any enforcement of sharing rules on the, the app. It's just pre-filtered by the time it comes out of the org. So there was a question on the side. Yes. Yeah. So we have so there is a force hybrid to build Cordova-based applications. That works for both iOS and Android, and then we have a Force React or React Native-based application, Force Droid, Force for Android applications. So, yeah. And everything we we have here, we have a smart store and smart sync plugin for Cordova and things like that. So we, we try to keep parity across every platform support. Oh, so I just have a question in the back. Yeah, the question was, will this work uh, with customer communities and community clouds? And the answer is, is yes. So I think we probably just have for one more question, but we're, we'll hang out as, as long as we can. And please feel free to come downstairs. We've got some folks there. Yes, I think I saw. Oh, oh I haven't heard from you yet. Okay, so if you build an uh, app to be for offline first with the local database and just sync with the server, So one thing we didn't show is when you do sync up or sync down, we have a merge mode as well. So you can say whether you want to overwrite by default or whether you want to leave it and treat it separately. So as you bring data down or up, you might not want to write over. So depending on your use case, sometimes you know, okay, if this user owns this object, his changes matter more than more recent changes already on the server. And it's true the other way around. So. All right. So I guess, uh, thanks, guys. We're going to have to wrap it up, unfortunately, to make room for the next session. But we'll hang out here in the room as long as we can or in the hallway. Or feel free to, to come downstairs and find us in the, uh, in the trailhead zone.